We are also honored this morning with the presence of our elders who have been with us all week. Their insights, understanding for what is going on with us as young people, the words of wisdom that have guided us the entire length of the way. We've decided that it would be good to have a panel discussion with them to discuss each one of them in their own words what is important about what we're doing, how it works with indigenous purposes, what respect means, whatever comes to mind and comes to their heart to share with us this morning. And so we'll begin with this end with David and work our way down to the other end, which is Esther. I mean, fair enough. just all the way to that conversation. And that will be the beginning of our morning. Haida Kawa. Haida, we have two ways of saying thank you. Two ways of saying thank you. Kawa is the religious common thank you. So if you're speaking, as my uncle's talking, if you're speaking to a man greatly respected, you say, Hawa's da. If you're speaking to a woman greatly esteemed, you say, Hawa Koja. And so for Chris, wherever she might be right now. Painting the blanket. <laughs> How a cool job, Chris. And to all of you, how it's done before this entire week that, we're, that, we, that we, we, we have been together, really together, and transformed. How it's done, how a cool job, and David. I will be honest. When we have gatherings in Ottawa, I look at my time and if I have a free moment, I run, run home, talk to my wife or see my grandchildren. But when I'm out of Ottawa, I participate more on the evening sessions, etc., etc. And also, I think I mentioned last year and the year before. Uh, Although we have um, on a schedule, uh, not very much on um, Inuit issues or that sort of stuff uh, throughout the week. Although I really enjoy my time yesterday morning and talking with you individually, and I put in my 100% effort to share with you uh, about my past, about my cu uh, culture, about my family, about my experience. And uh, and I learned also a lot from some of you who share your personal stories uh, uh, on METI and First Nation world. Thank you very much. Something struck when I was talking to my elders back home, it was so far back, it was still called Eskimo Point, now Achviet today. This gentleman has a strong feeling of passing on his language and culture to a younger generation. And he did that by recording what he believed and talk uh, to young people what he believed. So I want to share with you just a very short uh, uh, a reading uh, from that man. He's no longer with us today. Uh, his name was uh, Donald Suluk. And it's called Searing Knowledge. And this was recorded or written in 1987. Sharing knowledge by Do Donald Suluk. Young people often ask their elders about life long ago. They ask about many things, and the person who is asked explain as best as they can. All their Although there are some things that are no longer being done, many things still hold true today, like having to wear a right kind of warm clothing to go out 
hunting when the weather is minus 40, minus 50. These days, these days our elders and our young people have different kinds of knowledge. Elders know about things practiced long ago, and young people know more about how things are done today. For the good of everyone, elders and young people should communicate and share their knowledge. It is not good for a person to worry about something for a long time. When they can do things properly, they tend to give up. If they worry, they begin to look worn out like a person who is too tired, too cold, or too hungry. This can happen even when it appears there is nothing else wrong with their lives or with their relationship with others. If a young person's parents behave badly or don't act like adults, the young person may become very unhappy and he will worry because he can't talk to, th to them about it. He or she knows it is not his or her role to advise his elders. We should try to be good parents so that our young people will be happy. We should try to make sure our young people are not about us or afraid, afraid of us. Everyone knows it is frightening for young people when their parents are unhappy because the youngsters have nowhere else to turn. Parents, parents must act properly. They should not just try to be bossy and make young people afraid of them. Being frightened or being very frightened, frightening and making people comprehensive won't make things any better. I always told that we have to be wise like our elders. And of course, I, uh, I have been also told that even Sometimes elders do things that are wrong. And this is by late Daniel Suluk of Vakviet. I, I really love sharing it. That's all for me. And Joe? Thank you. Um, I was struck by uh, some words of John's this morning. He said that when he discovered he was Haida, he began looking for his heritage. And uh, I guess we have that in common because when I uh, discovered that I was Métis, I thought, that can't be possible. We, there was a family uh, gathering in central Alberta and we didn't know whether we belonged to that group or not, but my niece and I went, and our, I, it was a Sunday that we went down, and uh, we thought well, <coughs> we'd check them out. And if we liked their looks, we would, they, were, uh, they were in. They, we would accept them as family. <laughs> and if not, well, we would look elsewhere. Uh, but it turned out that they were all related to us. And uh, uh, so they, they were in. But uh, that, um, but meeting that group uh, that evening for supper, uh, the um, they had gathered at an old family site, and uh, there's a family graveyard there. So that was the activity we checked out the graveyard. The um, but that uh, evening for for supper there were 1,200 people that were served. And I thought, oh, my goodness, and I thought I was an orphan. <laughs> You sort of wonder which is better. <laughs> but it was uh, quite lovely. And also um, among this group was a, a genealogist from Edmonton 
who um, work, was, uh, had been studying the Métis of Western Canada for uh, quite a few years, and uh, he was delighted to meet us because he had been researching our family as well. And uh, he and, uh, later on, uh, he and uh, Gail Moran uh, collaborated in producing a, a book on, on the Métis of Western Canada. But, uh, so we have that thing in common, John. I didn't go as far as you did. <laughs> uh, but then Métis are nomadic people, so how could I? Uh, I've um, really enjoyed being with you all uh, this week. I feel that it's quite a privilege to have listened to uh, you as individuals, but also to uh, learn what you're working on and what you're uh, attempting to, to do in terms of relating to indigenous people. Um, it's almost like a dream come true because to, to meet you because, and to know that there are people who are interested in, in our history and our lives and are doing something about it. If, even if it is just recording the history or whatever you're uh, into researching. There needs to be a lot of uh, further uh, research into the uh, health of Aboriginal people. In the, uh, when I was involved with the study of chronic diseases for Métis people, um, we, um, we know that our physiology is different from First Nations and Inuit. And uh, we were able to identify uh, what we're prone to, the kinds of diseases that will affect us. And uh, it was not a, a happy picture, actually. I found out that I'm prone to heart disease and uh, um, other circulatory uh, illnesses. And, uh, but it made me realize that in, in identifying some of the diseases that would affect us as a family, it was uh, useful to know that uh, we weren't at fault in our lifestyles for developing these, ki de developing these kinds of, of diseases, that we were already prone to them in, in some way. The, uh, uh, I hope that there will be more research in that area of um, physical illnesses, but also um, I understand that there's a new uh, illness that is, is affecting the Inuit, it's, and it's sort of diet-related. So um, I, I just heard this about a week ago from a friend of mine whose husband has had this illness for over a year, and uh, it seems to be an intestinal disease, but probably, and they don't really have, um, it's very early in the diagnosis of that disease, and uh, so I hope to get more information about it, because um, in my working with the Inuit, they have enough to cope with without developing another <laughs> disease to worry about. But uh, the, um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that Dr. Kurtmeyer and his um, assistants in Montreal are working on uh, um, Aboriginal, uh, studying uh, Aboriginal uh, mental health and, uh, and probably just um, preparing some tools to address the issues so that, uh, well, finally we, we are beginning to have uh, um, a lot of psychiatric uh, nurses and, um, and also even psychiatrists are sort of cropping up amongst our population. So that's all good news. And, uh, but I, I think so much needs to be done to develop proper ins tools for examination and diagnosis uh, that are suitable to each of the groups. And uh, there's a whole raft of, um, of research projects out there that you could undertake, should you wish to. And this, to me, is a, a good start, just to know what work is going on and perhaps what work that you will continue in the future. Um, 
I've learned a great deal this week, and uh, it's, um, I'm one of those that I think John described as looking tired and, <laughs> and not well, but I'm just tired. And, and today my hair is tired, so what can you do? <laughs> so um, uh, David and I went to uh, the uh, Community Action and Police Committee meeting last, last night, and I'm sure he's tired today. But anyway, um, it's a committee that uh, is made up of, uh, it addresses race relations and diversity, and each of us are, um, have been selected by our communities to to rep, represent um, our community on on that committee. Uh, the committee is made up of uh, most of the ethnic groups in uh, in Ottawa, but we're still um, there are still a few missing. I think we have two from the there are two groups of Somali people in Ottawa, as you know, and uh, they those groups each have a representative on this committee. And there are Muslims and uh, and everybody, African people. Um, it's uh, it's quite. A, I, I just feel so privileged to be able to relate to representatives from those different groups. It's an opportunity uh, to get to know them and to understand their histories. And actually, with the um, Black community, we've discovered that uh, they. Um, their history is similar to ours in terms of uh, being shifted around and, and uh, um, persecuted to some extent. Uh, when my um, great uncle uh, escaped to the United States during the Re real resistance, that impact had on, on our family uh, was uh, quite uh, uh, explosive actually. Um, first of all, the name change took place. The, uh, uh, the, the people in this little community of our family um, went off in different directions, so that the whole family structure was. And so, um, and they never, I guess we sort of went underground, although I didn't know anything until I started uh, researching my genealogy. And, uh, but it, uh, they, they uh, dispersed to um, northern, um, northern Canada and western Canada and also to the United States, to Michigan and to uh, Montana particularly. And in, I'm continuing to sort out who these people are. And, uh, and that, two years ago I discovered that we have uh, Blackfoot relatives. And so I went to, my niece and I went to this, uh, it was my daughter and I. I get those two mixed up because they're very close to me. Only one's dead. <laughs> but anyway, we went to, uh, to Montana to check them out. And uh, it, was, uh, it was really, um, I followed the family of this uh, great uncle. And when he got to Montana, uh, when he came out of uh, isolation, he. Um, sent for his wife, and she packed up the the kids in a wagon, horses, and drove from uh, Central Alberta to Montana. But she had to go. Um, anybody that she met on the way, um, she told them that uh, she was going back home to uh, South Dakota or somewhere, and so um, so that's the direction she went, and then. Um, went into the United States and figured out where to go next, but at least she had gotten out of the questioning period, you know, the d danger of running into people that she knew. So, uh, and then when she stopped in, um, in the United States, she met a, a person who was traveling by uh, horseback from Montana to, um, to this area where she was. And she asked him if, if uh, he knew her husband. And he said yes. And she said, well, when you get back, you tell him that I, where I am and I'm not moving another step until he comes to get me. And uh, she was sick and tired of driving these horses and the kids and the cows and chickens and <laughs> extra horses. 
all his way across Canada. But anyway, <laughs> she, uh, she was a teacher and uh, he was a rancher. He, uh, and uh, his homestead is still in Montana. The family uses it as a summer home. And uh, it's uh, quite amazing. He's a legend in that area because he was a, a sharpshooter and a, an excellent hunter. And of course, he knew how to survive in, in the wilderness, which was, may not be useful today, but certainly was then. And uh, so it's interesting that the ac action of one person can really fracture a, a whole community or, or whatever, and, and causing them to spread out in, into different areas. Uh, you'll probably find that in some of your readings as well, that there used to be a community here, but they left. And, uh, and our family never talked about anybody, uh, you know, relatives or whatever. I remember one night, I was really, uh, I must have been about three or, or so, um, but I was wakened up in the middle of the night to, um, that we had visitors. There were two men who were traveling through um, our area and uh, I was frightened of them, but I was being shown off to them. Well, here's, you know, our latest baby, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't want to have anything to do with them. They were very white, <laughs> but they were my, um, my mother's brothers. And uh, um, I remember that one was named Isaac, and I had never heard that name before. So uh, I didn't want to have anything to do with them. But so when I began researching my genealogy, these two guys were going north. That's all I remember from that. I didn't even know what North was. But anyway, um, it was something quite exotic according to the atmosphere in the room. And uh, I believe that they went north to um, the, the Lubricon settlement and, and established themselves there and the community is named after them. And uh, so I probably have relatives there, but I, <laughs> it's on my to-do list to check them out. The, um, the Blackfoot uh, in... Uh, outside of Calgary were very welcoming to us when we went there. And uh, they, they're descendants of, uh, and my great-grandfather had six sons, and some of them, uh, well, with the dispersion of everybody, uh, some went to, to Montana and intermarried with uh, the Blackfoot Nation. And uh, one of their descendants uh, was adopted by the Blackfoot uh, south of or the, um, north of Calgary or somewhere, and uh, they adopted him. He grew up with them, and uh, they adopted him. And in the sixties, he was uh, he became their chief, and uh, it's a Siksik reserve just outside of uh, Calgary. And there they have this wonderful museum. It's it's so beautiful and has such extreme artifacts that, uh, um, and in the, the foyer, they have huge paintings of all of their traditional chiefs and in their regalia and wonderful feathers and the whole thing. And it comes together like this, all these separate portraits. And then in the middle is my relative, the, uh, their uh, Métis uh, chief, whom they uh, adopted as, so he's supposedly Blackfoot as well. And he's wearing a sports jacket and slacks. <laughs> what? Where are the, where's the regalia? <laughs> but anyway, I've talked too long. I want to wish you all uh, every good, good success and uh, in your work and also as you grow and overcome some of your shyness in in uh, venturing into the lives that you've uh, chosen, I, I hope you will realize and appreciate the fact that the Creator and the spirits of our ancestors will be with you. Thank you. We were going to have her speak before, but I guess she had to go out for a minute. But. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say thank you for the invitation.
that I received for the university to come and speak on behalf of the people. I'm sitting here and listening to my elders speak about their, their, their knowledge about their people. And, uh, and they were chosen to come and speak on their behalf. And I'm thinking about all the things I received um, to help me understand about the history of our people and all the medicines I received to help me understand who I am as an individual, as a Mi'kmaq person. Um, I'm going to try to make this short, like, because <laughs> I can be long-winded. Um, our brother rece received his blanket that represents his community, his family, his brothers, his sisters, connecting with the animal spirits which is the Eagle Clan and the Crow Clan. And learning about, learning about them and connecting with them and connecting with the land. Like I said, our people were always connected with the land, but they have forgotten. And we're here today to to remind them, a lot of our people back home need to stand up and take a hold of this, who they are, and be proud and value themselves. An elder had shared something with me a few years ago. What he, what she had gone through. Oh, what happened to the screen? <laughs> okay. Hey. <laughs> and um, she had received a peace pipe, and she didn't feel like she had, she was worthy of it. So one night she went to bed, and the creator, great spirit, whatever you want to call him, or the guardian angel, came to her and asked her, why would you not feel worthy to carry this peace pipe? He said, you were chosen to carry these things to help your people. And she didn't, under, she didn't know that word in her language, so when she woke up, she turned to her husband and asked, what does this mean? And she, he shared it in his language, New Daddy Jim, saying, you don't feel worthy enough because this is what the, what the spirit told her. You have to feel worthy for carrying these things in your life. These are your ancestors. These are the tools or the medicines. I wouldn't call them tools. Medicines that our ancestors carried, and we're just carrying them on. I just received a little bundle from my elder here, and I thank her. <laughs> and um, like I said, the last 30 years of my life, I've been collecting my bundle and learning about the sacredness and to value that because that's part of me. Our ancestors used these medicines to help them with their spirituality to help them with their health. They honored all the animals and prayed to them when they took their lives. Everything was so sacred. And I said, oh my God, I said, we were beautiful people. <laughs> I had to feel that pride. I had to instill that pride back in me. And using all these medicines helped. Um, I sat with an elder one time out, out out west and my first spiritual gathering I went to. And she said, while we were talking, she said, 
I seen a drum beside you. Have you ever asked for it? I said, I don't think so, because I don't know anything about this stuff. And I didn't, <laughs> because my parents weren't brought up with it. So, well, a drum, we, a drum is coming to you. And if you do, this is what you should do with it when it does. I said, oh, OK. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and she told me a lot of things. We were up all night. I kept the poor old lady up. But, uh, <laughs> but I had to pour out my heart. Anyway, the drum that some of our people held, hold represents the whole community, the whole universe. There's the animal that they took the life of a deer or an elk or a moose, whatever they use, and a tree. And then whatever design that's on there, or a logo, whatever you want to call it, represents something. Especially the big drum, the teaching that came to me from a young man. I don't even know who he is. Like I said, when the spirit moves people, they'll share their stories. And um, it represents the whole community, the people that are there to help one another. We talk about uh, the beat of the drum represents the heartbeat of Mother Earth. And I knew there was more to it than that. So when that teaching came to me, I said, that's it. And I'll share that teaching with you people. I haven't shared it with our people yet, not too many, maybe one-on-one. -on -one. Because it, I would get overwhelmed by this. The, dr the big drum on the top part of the drum represents the women. That's why it's the heartbeat of Mother Earth, the women. And the bottom of the drum represents the man, not because he's less than us, because he's the hunter. He's closest to the land goes fishing, provides the food for our people. The straps that ties the two hides together represents the council members, the people that work for us, the medicine men, so forth. And the other one that goes the other way represents the people. And we all hold on to one another as a community. And the stand that it has, some don't have stands, but that's OK. Maybe there's a reason behind it. The stand represents the creator that holds us all up. All these teachings, like everything we make, there was a purpose behind it, and a meaning, and there was value. These are our bundles we carry. We carry the whole community. We speak on behalf of our community to bring healing to our people. They take back their bundles to honor themselves. And I thank you that we can share, because we had talked about bridging that gap, sharing those teachings. And there's a lot more. Like I said, I can go on and on and on, but I'm not. I'm going to have to stop myself because there's my sister here that needs to, <laughs> to speak to. <laughs> but I thought I'd share that with you. And because you're trying to learn about what our people are about. Like I said, there's so much more. And a lot, a lot of our people don't have all this knowledge also. So we have to bring that back because it has been lost or forgotten, because it was beaded out of them. So uh, like I said, I thank you all for hearing our stories, hearing the heart of our people speak to you. And this is your bundle you're going to carry.
to bring to your people or to acknowledge the elders in a sacred way. Like I said, I thank my elder. <laughs> and uh, I had shared a few things about the bundle yesterday because some people said, what is a bundle? Oh. Well, you have your own bundles there too, I see. The knowledge, you want to carry the knowledge. That's a lot. Not only for our people, but for your people to gain understanding. Well, Alio, thank you. Uh, that's all I have to say. I, w I would like to share a song after. That's okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. <laughs> Cooking <laughs> I have to, uh, I was told I um, had my microphone on wrong. So I said, I have to button up my shirt. He goes, no, you have to put it lower. So I have to unbutton my shirt. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, people say that I bring a lot of sometimes uh, humor and I sat, and why do that too as well? First of all, we have this understanding too as well as part of like the clown medicine. We also have a lot of stories about the trickster. And what the trickster reminds us is uh, sometimes too we get so serious that don't take yourself so seriously. Life's not meant to be serious all the time. We're here also to enjoy ourselves, that we have a good life. And good life is Pamadzuan. So that's why I um, try and incorporate humor because I, I do a lot of uh, events and one event was very heavy and, uh, and dealing with not only the disclosure, uh, for example, of the murdered and missing and, for example, the residential school. So afterwards, it's a reminder to as well because it changes your energy. Uh, so that's... And I always say that, I always remember that too, especially too as well. And I see that school can get pretty intense. Mm. <clears throat> going back, I was going to say too as well, uh, one of the things I learned this week too um, is that there's good food here. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> I, and speaking of food, um, I ran, I love listening to, for example, Farah. And she mentioned one of the biggest things is the Jerusalem artichoke. And she brought, she brought um, samples here on the table over there. And that's indigenous. It was an indigenous um, food product. Mm -hmm. And she was wondering why it was lost, like uh, First Nations stopped using it. And I said, well, you got to also understand too as well when the history and how, for example, for us, it's, it's different again because of the reserve system. Even then you were watched so much and uh, the degradation of the knowledge included the degradation of our understanding and connection to plants. Even when I was a little girl growing up, we had a medicine person across the road and uh, the police would come and harass them saying, if you make medicine, we're going to throw you in jail. And so people don't understand the system of oppression that we've been through. We didn't understand it either until this, all this uh, residential school TRC came out. For us as Algonquin too as well, the uniqueness is uh, even recently, I had to digest all that, is that this whole residential school system started here, Ottawa. Mm. The founders of Ottawa U, the Oblate brothers, um, again, uh, played a big part of that in the creation of the residential school system. And, the, uh, and so that's why when we talk about reconciliation, I'm glad that we're in a, also a learning institution because um, uh, it evolved to a learning institution, but also to as well, like an example is, if I remember correctly, in 1941, one of the statistics is they had 41 
residential schools across the Dominion. They had 61 outposts uh, and 18 Indian hospitals. So for us as Algonquin and Anishinaabeg here too as well, yes, we were chased off this area too. And in, there's stories about Indian hunters and uh, going and the creation of our reserves and the scattering of our people. And uh, coming from Lake of Two Mountains, which is by Oka, which is the traditional lands, and uh, leaving there and, and spreading out to Quebec, Ontario. And I remember one of the stories too as well, they, they said that is, um, There was, um, they didn't like us very much at these outposts, these newcomers. But every time we'd, we'd, we'd leave and try to get away from them, they'd follow us. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, because if you read in the history books too, there was this uh, love-hate relationship. And because they needed the Indians to survive because of the knowledge, again, of the plants, the land, the, uh, the game. So again, and then here we are today. So that's why I brought the little display to as well over there in the corner um, and uh, from our cultural center. The example is I, I, I spoke about the canoe, but I brought in the snowshoes. One pair of snowshoes is made by, was made by Elder Kamanda, but it shows our housing. But even the snowshoes, that was knowledge in itself. Like the average uh, hunter would have about four pairs of snowshoes. Because again, it was because of the consistency of the snow, they would be different. So that's knowledge too as well, uh, our housing, and you'll see the cradle board. So there's all teachings towards that. Now, now I'm going to go really quickly. Um, the, one of the sessions that I didn't sit in yesterday that we were, um, um, is what they spoke on the grandmothers. And I've been part of the grandmothers for a number of years. I was an official grandmother until three years ago. Well, two years ago. I have a grandchild. But I was, I've always been a helper. And even when we were small, my mom was very uh, insistent on the culture and the language. And we were four. I remember going to the powwow at Bitterby Lake with William. And we'd have Indians from all over the states and, and the, the region. And I always remember going back, and one one um, summer we liked going there because we were like kids running wild, <laughs> and uh, and we'd meet other Indian kids, and we'd learn our dances and run in the bush, and so uh, and uh, and but once and I remember this as a little girl, we were going there because you go camp, and uh, my parents having to go straight because the police were there. And the police were there to stamp out the fires. And they were threatening to arrest everybody for what we take for granted today. We, we even have powwows here now on Carleton University. And all we did was, and the powwow was also just a celebration of coming together. Like I said, to, in the, in to that, if you look at the winters here, uh, sometimes you didn't survive, so you, you celebrate that you survived another winter. So that's what the powwow gathering is. And you dance. And what my sister said here was also too, with the drum. We call that odewe gun. It's a hard instrument. And, and you drum and you dance. You drum in honor of being alive, <coughs> to honor that you're, you're still here. So that's why, um, and then with the grandmothers, uh, just really quickly, uh, what we did in, in our community, we would meet in the lodge. And some of the things that we've done is like we did a restorative justice session for a youth. And I talk about that because then we had, uh, that was, uh, people wanted to know how effective that was. So I wish I had more time. I, I would talk about that. Also, uh, they would talk about, um, we went with the court cases too as well with the right to hunt and fish, plus also too as well this whole lands claim. So, was, so there's big issues in terms of also like historical, and that's why I like sitting down and I, I'd say myself too, so I always found myself, they'd say, oh, are you, you're an elder. And I said, I feel funny about that. I said, because I've always been a helper. And I'm not sure 
And then I do try and get elders. I said, you want to come and talk in Ottawa? They said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the elders told me that, like, when uh, to go ahead and speak uh, because uh, I'm in Ottawa. I work in Ottawa. I work at Min Wash and Lodge. But at the same time, I'm still connected back home. We do the language symposiums and stuff like that. So now to close, I'm going, I brought a little, um, I had a little poster done. And it's, it's maybe just a little summary of, uh, I always said that. It, it, it's done by Douglas Cardinal, who used to come and sit with us also in the, uh, in, in the lodge. <clears throat> and I, why I, I, um, I need a little stick. <laughs> I'll go down here, son. Why I brought this to you as well is because what he did was he explained to me one day why he made this poster. And I know it might be a little dim from the way back. It was uh, the two world views. You have the uh, non-native world view and the native world view here. And he started at the top. He said, like, uh, the native, if you look at the parliamentary system, it operates, he said it operates on man's law, so it's a hierarchy system. Even the government is a hierarchy system. While the native view was in a circle, it was, was based on nature's law, and, and it's based on off the land <coughs> and in the circle, everybody. So this would represent, again, like the consensus system and the system here of um, majority rules and uh, the leader or the uh, king makes the decision. So again, then you go down to as well, like with, um, he said, like, again, the uh, person at the top rules. Again, this one is also to always incorporating nature's law. Here they had, a, he said, patriarchal system. It was a patriarchal system. And it's the dominion over nature and, and conquering our own nature. Well, he said there's more the matriarchal system, but I say it's more matrilineal system. And where um, women are at the center, also the power, and you share power. The second part, really quickly, is what he looks at is also, too, as well, like it, it goes with the justice system. And the system tends to be like, why they have the half man here is that it's based on good and evil. Either good, you, you're either good or you're evil. You either pass or you fail. <laughs> in, a, in an educational. <laughs> and, and the uh, native justice or understanding is that we're all on our own journey here and, and we're all born in, innately good, but sometimes we fall off our path as we come here and it's like the crooked good. So how do we get back on, back into balance in nature? Then the, again with the education system, uh, it's like um, knowledge. The understanding is, he, say, he was saying that people, even with children, they were born tabla rasa, meaning they're, they're born with clean slates and all you have to do is fill them up with knowledge. And, uh, but the native understanding is we're also born with our own spirit and inner knowing. And so, uh, and you're only smart when you have your degree or um, diploma or whatever. But the other understanding too as well is that uh, it's, it's also your intu intuition. So he's saying uh, like, this is powerful too, passing down knowledge from generation to generation. But from the, also the native understanding is not coming from knowledge is also powerful because that's the creativity and it's almost like the left brain, right brain. So again too as well, like the, the institutions here, you have like your, your uh, computer labs and we, we have the lodge. The, the thing is too as well on both sides, one comes with the nature, the other one is, is the creation coming from um, the creation of cities. And uh, he always said too as well, there's no right or wrong way. Each system has its merits and each system has its, um, his, um, what's the name for that? The, um, there's the merits, but also what's the opposite of merits, but uh, drawbacks. 
And I think our biggest, biggest challenge, especially to, and I see that too as well, like as we're gathering here today, how do we balance, balance both systems? Because if we overdevelop too much here, what are we doing to the earth? And uh, so that's where I think when we're coming together for uh, like what we're doing this week, I think that's our challenge too as a people. And for us as our understanding is too as well because we're here for the next seven generations. We're here for such a short time. And uh, what are we leaving behind for our future children's children's children? And, and that's where what knowledge to and um, our actions. So I guess that's it for me. So I say miigwech. <laughs>
bring it the four direction. And uh, that's to bring healing to our mind, spirit, and body. So I hope you guys all feel good and bring all that good knowledge with you and carry that bundle well. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bear story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> two, weeks, two, week, two weekends ago, we went to Omega Park with my grandson and my son. So uh, they have bears there too. Eh? They had like they have about six, seven big bears, and they're fat. For spring, they're fat because they're well fed. So, uh, <laughs> so we, we go. You drive through with your car. So for us, our understanding too, when you speak to the bear, they understand. That's why the importance of the language too. So uh, other people were with these bears. So I said, let's go there. There's, there's two bears. So we drive up. I turned up. I, I, I put the window down and I said, Kwe-makwa. And he's walking away like that, and they're, they're what is big? He's walking like that. And I said, Kimonki diena? And I'm laughing again because I said, Hi, bear. I said, Do you have a big fat ass? Eh? <laughs> and, and, and he's walking away like that, and he stops. <laughs> and he looks at me and goes, I think you better look at your own ass. <laughs> So I, I needed a bear healing song today. <laughs> we will, I'd like to thank very much from the heart, David and Joe and Esther and Verna for their services through the week and taking care of our needs and answering our questions. It has been an honor to serve with you and I look forward to doing it again. We're going to be on break for 15 minutes, but I'm, I'm going to say one thing. I've been debating this in my mind, whether it would be understood or not, whether I should say it. Sometimes when I do that, I shouldn't say it. Say it. But I am going to say it. When I looked around the room, I noticed that there are, we are, first I'll preface it by saying we hide it, people. Our matriarchal and matrilineal. <laughs> I looked around the room the other day, and I noted that only four or five of us in this room they're working together are men, the rest are women. And it's a good and a right thing. Because I think we men have dominated this universe for way too long, this world, in many places other than here. And to keep in mind what I believe it was Chief Joseph when he said, a people is not defeated, a people are never defeated until the hearts of their women are on the ground. Thank you for honoring us with your presence and with everything that you've contributed this day. Every woman, every man here. And we reconvene in 15 minutes. <laughs>